Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's session, the intersectional experiences of women of color in the workplace. My name is Desiree Cormier-Smith. I'm the Senior Advisor in the Bureau of International Organization Affairs at the U.S. Department of State, and I'm honored to serve as the moderator for this important panel discussion. Most women are familiar with being the only woman in the room, but Black women and women of color often face additional challenges and stereotypes that are compounded by bias and racism. Intersectionality, as coined by scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. I'm really thrilled to be joined by three phenomenal women today who are here to share their experiences and insights on what companies can do to enhance the intersectional experience of women of color as they navigate the working world. In no particular order, our panelists are Allison Lawrence, president at Black & Decker, Stanley Black & Decker, Vanessa Okurare, principal at Edward Jones, and Kim Jenkins, global head of diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging at PayPal. So I'm gonna start with Allison. Allison, all of you are members of senior leadership at your respective organizations. And as you've moved up the ranks, you have likely at times found yourself the only one in the room and at the table. How did you navigate this experience in the workplace? As the president of Black & Decker, Allison, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Desiree, for the question. Glad to be here along with these uh, other esteemed panelists. You are absolutely right. Uh, I have certainly been the only one like me in the room at our company. Uh, we've come a long way at Stanley Black & Decker. We have a very uh, evolved, diverse, inclusive culture, but it hasn't always been that way over the 19 years that I've been there. And some of the things that I've done as I've navigated the experience are one, I've exercised my voice early when I've been in the room. We have expertise, we bring to the table skill sets and experiences that are beneficial. And sometimes when you're the only one in the room, you find that imposter syndrome uh, trying to impose itself. So I feel like for me personally, when I've exercised my voice, it's boosted my confidence, it's helped combat that imposter syndrome, and it's reminded me along with everyone else in the room that I do in fact belong there. So that's number one. Number two, I would say, is find an ally or two or three. Some people struggle with this concept of having friendships at work, and I completely understand that. But I think when you're the only one in the room, it's really beneficial to have at least one person that is a trusted voice, that can provide feedback along the journey, that can be a sounding board for you as you bounce off business ideas and problems with them, as well as potentially be an advocate for you when you are not in the room. And so I would highly recommend finding an ally uh, if you find yourself to be the only one in the room. And then lastly, for me, I would say it's really important to remember that the assignment is bigger than you. You know, we absolutely do not have all the same experiences. I don't have the same experiences as Kim and Vanessa or yourself in corporate America, but I do bring into every room uh, many perspectives that may never make their way into the conversation. So remembering that, leaning into that responsibility, it is personally a motivation for me. So those are a couple of things that have helped me along my own journey. Thanks for sharing that, Allison. Kim, would you like to add anything to, the, to that question? So first of all, thank you for having me. And I want to echo a couple of things that Allison said as well. Early in my career, one of my mentors told me two things. One, to never get comfortable accepting less. And two, to always be comfortable being the only one in spaces where people like me have not historically been welcomed. So when I have found myself in situations where I've been the only one, I put the burden on myself to ensure I don't decrease my expectations of what the group environment should feel like. What I mean by that is, in those moments, it can be re really easy to feel like an outsider, like Allison mentioned, that imposter syndrome kicks in. Instead, I am intentional about ensuring I feel valued, I feel respected, and I feel appreciated. While at the same time, I empower myself to be authentically me and engaged based on my unique perspectives to let my superpowers show in the moment. I love that. Vanessa, I would love to hear your thoughts on this question. 
Yes, of course, Desiree. And again, I'll, I'll extend my, my thanks to, to all of you for having me as part of this discussion. And, and I'll just amplify what um, you know, Kim and Alison have said. And while it's still common to be the only person of colour in many professional settings, it's a lot better than what it used to be in the earlier years of my career. And I think Alison mentioned that. I know for many of us, as hard as we've worked, we've felt the need to justify why we are in certain areas, why we are in certain spaces or, or places professionally, and that can be mentally draining. So for me, um, I learned early on that, that hard work or getting the right qualifications and experiences wasn't enough. It was important for me to build relationships and build a support system uh, for navigating through this experience and not feeling the need to dial down who I am and, and making sure that my network, my support system is diverse where not everyone looks or thinks like me. And that's helped to, to enable me grow in, in different ways. The other thing that has been beneficial for me as I've navigated through this experience is leveraging my global mindset. So that comes from living in different parts of the world. And, and my experience of living say, in, in a place like Nigeria, as an example, where being Black in any space is the norm, really helps to enforce uh, this strong sense of self, or of resilience, of what my ability to impact and contribute um, can be. And it's enabled me to speak up and in many ways create that, that positive environment and, and the right conditions for everyone to thrive. And I think that's why it's so important for mm -hmm. organizations to really amplify that place of belonging and develop a community for everyone to be successful. Indeed. As the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion has been emphasized in recent years, we've heard the importance of team members bringing their authentic selves to the workplace. There is also the counter argument that no one truly brings their full self to the workplace. How do you strike this balance in your work life? Um, Kim, I'd love to start with you to hear how, you've um, how you strike this balance. Okay, thank you for that. So, that's an interesting question, and there's a lot into it, so I'm going to dissect it a little bit. First, let me start by acknowledging the fact that the topic of diversity and inclusion have been relevant for many, many years. However, we can all accept the fact that the tipping point in 2020 augmented the significance and increased the awareness of opportunities to address broad systemic inequities. As it relates to bringing your authentic self to the workplace, let me start by saying this. Many of us, for various reasons, have had to employ covering and code switching most of our lives in order to be accepted into environments and cultures that we historically have not been parts of. One would wonder, does someone cover because they have to or because they want to? I think that becomes the question we have to be willing to accept. So to dissect this, you have to be willing to accept the power dynamics of a workplace or a cultural environment. What is happening to make someone feel the need to be less than authentic? Is the space mm -hmm. truly accepting of various perspectives or does the space truly embrace diversity? When you're willing to pause and ask yourself those questions, you can find several things that are contributing to not fixing the person, but fixing the culture of the environment and allowing space for people to be themselves. At PayPal, inclusion is one of our four core values. And we have employee resource groups that empower, encourage, and embrace various individual characteristics, which, which while intentionally defined to create community, are open to everyone to create space to share, to learn, and to grow together, because none of us can do this by ourselves. The objective is not to become homogeneous. We refer to it as harmony, not harmony as in singing in one tune, but in singing with various tunes to create beautiful harmonies and melodies. And so for me personally, the value that I bring is only evident when I don't have to pretend or perform. When I can be my true authentic self, I can be the best version of me that I can be. That's the true value of inclusion. And I hold myself accountable for stepping into the power of my unique individu individuality. It's important for me to be me because let's be honest with ourselves, it's easier to be ourselves than it is to pretend to be someone or something that we aren't. Bringing yourself to work 
bringing your whole self, bringing your authentic self allows you to shake loose all the things that you're trying to hide and feel valued, appreciated, respected, and welcomed. And personally, at this stage of my career, there is no balance for me to strike. You asked, how do I balance it? Earlier in my career, I needed to be able to fit in, to feel like I needed to fit in. And as Vanessa and Allison said, the world was quite different before than it is today. Today, I feel it's important for people to be their authentic selves and be valuable based on who you are, not based on what people want you to appear to be. And that to me is the significance of bringing yourself to work and in terms of striking the balance that works in the cultural environment you're a part of. Thanks, Kim. Um, Allison, I'd love to hear how you strike that balance and any advice you may have for women out there, women of color who are struggling to strike that balance. Yeah, it's such a good question, Desiree. And I love a lot of the points that uh, Kim articulated, particularly that it takes energy to pretend and it takes energy to perform. And personally, I don't have that much energy to contribute to those <laughs> elements. I'd rather just come and, and be myself. And so one kind of practical tip that's worked for me is that Sure, I understand there's parts of myself that I only kind of want to keep for family and loved ones, but we all spend a ton of time at work. So I think it'd be really hard to be pretending and performing and not being ourselves all day. So drawing boundaries, perhaps about what I will share with my colleagues at work from a personal perspective, maybe it's my holiday plans, maybe it's pictures of my uh, adorable niece and nephews, but not necessarily talking about some other parts of my life. I think if we are not those people naturally who show up and can spend the entire day kind of being ourselves and relax like we would elsewhere, let's pick perhaps and be deliberate about some other parts of our life that we can share. Because is, it is important to have rapport at work. We spend a lot of time working and I think it's a lot more enjoyable when you can get to know your colleagues and they can get to know a little bit about you too. Yeah, that's great advice. Vanessa, what about you? How do you strike that balance and what advice would you have for someone struggling to strike it? Well, Desiree, I think it's very similar to what uh, Kim and Allison have shared. For authenticity to exist, there needs to be psychological safety, right? So not everyone is going to bring their entire selves um, to work. I think it's very nuanced, but we have got to ask ourselves about the environments that we're creating. Are we creating a place where people do feel comfortable um, sharing their, their thoughts and their perspectives? Or do we have a situation where there's a fear of failure or there's a fa fear of speaking up? Or, and whether that's because they're either real or perceived consequences of doing so. If we have that type of environment, then people are going to put up what I call that cloak of conformity when they're coming into work every day. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as leaders to, to make sure that we are creating an environment where people can, can share. And, and for me, that comes from role modeling the behaviors that I want to see reflected around me. So whether that's being transparent, whether that's being very respectful of, of different points of views, whether that's showcasing um, a different perspectives and, and showing some vulnerability uh, and sharing a bit about myself and encouraging my, my peers and my you know, leaders to do so, I, I think that's really what helps us to, to create um, some, you know, some kind of balance, you know, call it balance, call it harmony. I, I, I think it's a bit of that. And the, the other piece I would add is that there's something around making sure that your core values, your purpose is aligned with the, with the purpose and the core values of your organization. I think once you've got that at the high level, you know, everything else, you know, you can kind of negotiate. It's very nuanced. Um, but when you have that, that match, I, I think there's so much more that we can do from there. Uh, and at Edward Jones, as an example, we, we are encouraging uh, more of this to happen by expanding our business resource groups, by expanding our courageous conversations beyond what we, beyond some of the common topics that we, we um, converse about at work. And really taking that into the communities. We're expanding our learning opportunities so at least more people can understand what it means to create that positive environment where authenticity thrives. Because when you have authenticity, people are more likely to be creative. You're going to have that great tension and friction that really encourages us to go deeper, you know, uh, in ourselves and come up with all these creative ways of doing things. And that's, that's
that's good for business. It can only be great for business. Yeah, that's such an important point. Um, Vanessa, I'm actually going to come back to you with this next question. Sponsorship is key is the key to success for employee advancement in many sectors. In Rosalind Chow's Harvard Business Review article entitled, Don't Just Mentor Women and People of Color, Sponsor Them, she states, and I quote, sponsorship alone isn't enough to address the deep-seated challenges associated with systemic racism, but it is a personal action that all of us can take to help make the world a more equitable space, end quote. What steps is your organization taking to provide sponsorship opportunities for women employees of color? Uh, by the way, Desiree, I, I read that article. I think it's a brilliant article. A lot has been written about sponsorship and mentoring. And, and I think, you know, she really calls it out and gives some specific um, examples as to what organizations and individuals um, can do. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, at Edward Jones, first of all, mentoring has always been a treasured part of our tradition, of our core values, of our, our culture. And we, uh, we've encouraged that for, for decades. We're, we're a century old now. And that's something that permeates throughout our, our organization. We encourage our, our financial advisors to develop mentoring relationships and they don't compete against each other. They're working hand in hand to make sure that everyone can be successful. We've got a mentoring program where everyone can be a part of. Um, and, and what we're doing now is really evolving that. So yes, we've got mentoring, which is foundational, uh, where you know two people or two or more people are working together on something really specific. There's a lot of feedback going on. There's a lot of um, coaching um, going on there and, and there's learning. With, with sponsorship, that takes it to a different level where it's, it's more of a measured approach. Um, and, and, and it's mostly done by, by people in senior uh, positions where they're using their social capital to amplify someone else, amplifying their competencies, their skills, their potential, and doing it in rooms where these people might never get the chance to be. And, and that's what sponsorship is all about. And so one of the ways that we're doing that at Edward Jones, again, is starting with the um, knowledge awareness, so the, the learning awareness, building more capability for people to realize that they can be better allies, they can be sponsors for, for, for women, for women of color, and, and in so doing that, you're, you're creating that environment for everyone uh, to be successful. And when I look at my personal um, journey, when, when I started out at, at Edward Jones, and, and that was almost 21 years ago, the, the people who were my sponsors then looked nothing like me. Um, they were all white male uh, and one white female. And if I had been looking around for someone like me to be a sponsor for me, you know, I would have waited quite a long time. And so my encouragement to people is to really understand that they have social capital, even though, you know, on the spectrum, it, it does vary, but making sure that you're using your voice to amplify um, someone else's um, potential, because that makes a difference. That that makes a, a difference to society, that makes a difference to organizations. And that's where you can, you can start to see the pipeline um, continuing to develop. You're bringing new people in, but you're also making sure that the people who are already at the organization are having the right advancement opportunities and internal mobility um, continues to improve. And I, I do believe that th that does wonders uh, for retention, especially uh, in the environments that we're, we're in now. Yeah, definitely. Kim, I'd love to hear your thoughts on sponsorship and what steps your organization is taking to provide more opportunities for sponsorship, particularly for women of color. Um, thank you, Desiree. So I will echo every single thing Vanessa said. The one thing I will add is who are you sponsoring? Who are you making sure has opportunities, exposure, and access. There's no shortage of mentorship, sponsorship, coaching, guidance happening across all of our organizations, across all of our industries. The question is who's benefiting from those things. And so in our organization at PayPal, we have been extremely intentional about making sure people don't self-declare 
they are actually held accountable to outcomes. So everyone wants to call themselves an ally, but what does it truly mean to be an ally? Everybody wants to call themselves a sponsor, but are you truly sponsoring and what outcomes are being driven by the sponsorship and advocacy you create for people when they're not in the room? So what we're doing is being very intentional about looking at who are you sponsoring? Who are the people you feel comfortable staking your claim, your name, your brand against? Who are you creating opportunities for? And is that population of people diverse? Or is there an opportunity for us to leverage our sponsorship capital for people who have historically been underrepresented in those spaces? And that's what we're very intentional about at PayPal. And that's what we're doing. And that's what we're being mindful of. And that's what drives retention, as Vanessa referred to. I love that. Allison, would love to hear your thoughts on sponsorship as well as the, any steps your organization is taking to ensure there are greater sponsorship opportunities, particularly for women of color. Uh, thank you, Desiree. I was hoping you would ask me. Uh, sponsorship has become really personal to me the last few years of my career. Uh, I sit here now president of the Black & Decker division at Stanley Black & Decker, but the last two and a half years I was chief of staff to our CEO, Jim Lurie. I met Jim at a board meeting about three years ago. And after having a conversation, hearing a little bit about my experiences, he invited me to meet with members of his executive team. And then that led to an invitation to step into the first ever role of a chief of staff at Stanley Black & Decker, over a $14 billion company at the time. And that to me has catalyzed two and a half years of mentorship, of learning, of sponsorship. I've evolved tremendously at a, as a leader, had an impact on our organization, and now stepping into this higher level of responsibility with the Black & Decker division. And so Jim's actions, his confidence in me, his faith in me, really uh, taking personal stake and plucking me out of what was uh, mediocrity from a professional standpoint. I had delivered over the years. I'd been with the company 15 years and had a solid contribution. But just his uh, knack to see that I had tremendous potential as a leader and to make that leap of faith has literally changed my professional life. And now two and a half years later, there are over a dozen chief of staffs inside of Stanley Black & Decker. They so happen to be majority uh, females and they so happen to be uh, women of color as a majority as well. So uh, Jim's confidence and opportunity to me has opened up career pathways for plenty at Stanley Black & Decker. So it's an example like that that I think about and, and Vanessa and Kim said this as well that leaders need to evaluate. You don't have to be the CEO, uh, Jim was certainly, uh, but you can be in the C-suite, you can be a leader, a senior leader. Uh, move beyond the boundaries, look for opportunities for that talent in your company. I heard someone say often, talent is plentiful, opportunity is not. And so look for where you can give folks opportunity to step into those roles. That's my personal story. It has certainly helped shape uh, my future from a professional standpoint, that experience. And I'm forever grateful to Jim, but our organization is doing things broadly for women as well. Uh, we are a part of the McKinsey Black Leadership Academy that they launched a couple of years ago. I think it was in response to kind of their racial equity roadmap. We sent every single uh, African-American employee in our company through that program in its early years and have now expanded to those of Latinx and Asian heritage as well, largely women, largely women of color. And we've also established an executive sponsor program that does the same. It's back to what uh, I think Vanessa was talking about with intentionality. Who are you mentoring? Who are you bringing up? Now, those programs are open to everyone across our organization, but the group that manages it is certainly very careful to make sure there's equal, if not greater, representation amongst our diverse population. So a lot of great programming inside of our company, but also at the highest level in our CEO, putting uh, action to it as well. That's fantastic. And what a great story. Thank you for sharing your personal story. I think it's a real powerful testament to the power of sponsorship. So one last question for all you ladies. Um, what is the number one thing that you recommend organizations do to create a safe environment for all employees, especially women of color, to share their perspectives and stories? So Vanessa, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Desiree, I would say let senior leadership 
model what that looks like. And once the organization sees senior leadership, we can start to see those behaviors cascading down across the organization and it becomes part of the cultural mindset, it becomes acceptable. So let senior re leadership role model what that means for the organization and then everyone else follows. I love that. It's something that we say um, in diplomacy, we should lead not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. Uh, Kim would love your thoughts on that. Um, so thank you. Um, I would say this, and I'll add to what Vanessa said, let senior leadership authentically and genuinely model those behaviors because people can see through a fake and a phony very quickly and that could impact the outcomes. I would also say focus on what you're ultimately trying to accomplish. Why do I say that? In all of these efforts around diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging, you have to be mindful of are people wanting to maintain their careers in our environment? At PayPal, we have something called intent to stay. Do people not only just want to come here, do they want to stay here? And it is important that leadership creates a culture and an environment where everyone can be their authentic self and purposefully add to the business of the organization. And so recognize that we all have biases. That does not make us malicious human beings. That just means that once we accept it, we can address it and we can involve it. Indeed. Allison? Yeah, I mean, how can you follow uh, those comments? I completely agree with my uh, fellow panelists. I think, you know, we think of big programmings when we look to answer these questions. We think of what we can do, what we can activate, what events can we hold, Desiree? And I think it's really in the ordinary every day. You know, are we celebrating the women in our organization and the women of color in our organization? Are we recognizing their contributions on a consistent basis? Are we waiting for some big event to do so? Or is it generally just a part of our culture? Are we supporting when we gather, when women gather, when women uh, of color gather, such as in employee resource groups or in uh, their designated months, Black History Month, Women's History Month? And are we really uh, putting our money where our mouth is? Do we have great representation, significant representation in the highest ranks of our company? Do we see women taking president roles and senior leader roles? What do the numbers say? Being transparent with the data. Back to employees sniffing out whether it's authentic or not, that's what they're looking for. The really day-to-day, -day ordinary welcome for women and women of color in the workplace. And that, I would argue, is where they'll want to stay and work. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for your incredible insights. Um, you all have been incredibly generous with your time. We know how busy you are. So it means a lot that you spent some time with us today and shared your really insightful thoughts and your suggestions. Um, it was a really rich discussion. I could keep going, but I know we do not have time. Uh, so let me just thank you again for, for your participation in today's discussion and for your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.